Now, we're going to be thinking this afternoon just a little bit about what the Bible says uh, in relation to uh, the lead up to Easter time, in a sense. And you might say, well, what was the lead up to Easter? Well, believe it or not, the lead up to Easter begins in Genesis. And uh, you might think to yourself, that's a strange, a strange thing for a preacher to be involved in you know, for the gospel and speaking about the cross and speaking about Easter time uh, to do to speak about that, to go, to go right back as far as that. But first of all, we're going to read uh, some uh, scriptures together uh, just to clarify some things in the New Testament. Um, and we're going to read, first of all, in John's Gospel in chapter 1. So John chapter 1, just for a very short reading. Uh, and then we'll refer to some other scriptures as we go along. John chapter 1. Verse 38. Verse 38, uh, sorry, verse, verse 35, I beg your pardon, verse 35. And again the next day, from John 1, 35, and again the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed after was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, which, uh, it, and he, he first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah which is being interpreted, the Christ. And as he brought him to G and he brought him to Jesus, and when he beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, uh, thou hast uh, th thou shalt be called uh, Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Uh, and moving on to the next few verses, the day following. Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, which saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was, was of Bethsaida, a city of Andrew, uh, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nath Nath Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said unto him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. And Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered, and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered, and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Now, that's just a very short reading in a sense, but it's, it's uh, touching on something I want to just think about this afternoon as we uh, maybe go back into the Old Testament uh, and look and see what it has to say. And so our first thought today is just about this, what, what Nathaniel um, uh, was told. Nathaniel's friend came to him, uh, his name was Philip, and Nathaniel's friend said to him, we have, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so that little phrase there, we have found him uh, of whom Moses and the prophet in the law and the prophets did write. I want to think about that just a little bit this afternoon uh, as we move back into the Old Testament scriptures in a moment. There are seven references in the New Testament to that type of statement, um, that statement which says, uh, which were written on the law and of Moses. Uh, and so it's referring back to the Old Testament. It's, it's telling us in the New Testament that we need to refer back to the Old Testament to think about 
the state, this person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's wonderful. The first person we find that we're going to think about this afternoon, we've, we find that he's, this, this chap, Philip, is telling his friend about the Lord Jesus. And so this afternoon, I want just to, just to say to you, it's wonderful if you've got a friend uh, and they don't know about the Lord Jesus, that you tell them about him. Tell your friends about the Lord Jesus. That's what Nathaniel did. Uh, that's what, sorry, that's what uh, Philip did to Nathaniel. He, he told him about his, uh, this person. Uh, and he says, this is not just anybody. This is the person that was written about in the Old Testament. Uh, and so <clears throat> we can think about a man who uh, was under a fig tree in the Lord Jesus saw him uh, and proved to him that he was the son of God. But you know, he wasn't the only one that told people about the Lord Jesus, because we find that same, very same, or very similar statement in the book of the Acts in chapter 26. Uh, and if we were to read it there, we would be hearing about Paul as he stood before King Agrippa. So it wasn't just a, a friend uh, of his, this time he was, Paul was speaking to a king, uh, and he said to him, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying, none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Uh, and so the, the king Agrippa was going to hear about this person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and he, he refers him back to the Old Testament. Now, of course, when they were, these men were speaking, there wasn't a New Testament. But they were, the New Testament was being written, in, as a sense, in the statements that they made. And then Paul, later on in the follow in the chapter 28, he speaks to a group of Jews, and he speaks to them in relation to the Lord Jesus. And he says, and when they had appointed a day, they, there came many to him in his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And so there's three occasions already uh, in the New Testament where the uh, Old Testament is referred to uh, and in relation to people telling their friends. So it's important that we tell our friends about the Lord Jesus. But you know, not only is it in relation to uh, our friends, but it's also in relation to the resurrection of Christ and the resurrected Christ, because the Lord Jesus refers to these things. Uh, he says this in Luke chapter 24, and, the beginning, and beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so the Lord Jesus uh, is, before, the, before people like Paul uh, and so on were getting involved in this, the Lord Jesus was telling people, that they needed to think about what was said in the Old Testament in relation to his uh, death and to, in relation to the, uh, the, the things which he would do and be while he was here in this world. Uh, and then he says in Luke chapter 24 and 44, and he said to them, uh, these are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that, the th that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and of the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And so the Lord Jesus uh, is telling people with regard to these things that had been said previously. Now, they're important things, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but they are the only, the only two groups of people. The first group of people were people telling their friends uh, and telling kings and so on and so forth and, and religious Jews. Uh, and there's also the Lord Jesus speaking. But, you know, <clears throat> there's also a plea uh, from the afterlife, in a sense. There's a, in, in Luke chapter 16, we hear of a man who's left this scene of time, and uh, he is making a plea to tell his friends uh, from, the, from the, uh, the, the other side of life, shall we call it. He's telling his friends, trying, uh, trying to get Abraham to tell his friends about uh, the Lord Jesus. And you know what Abraham's statement was? Here it is. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And then he says, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if one rose from the dead. So this man had a plea that somebody, he might be able to go back and tell his brothers that not to come to this place. 
Uh, and so the statement, this statement about the Old Testament scriptures is important for us then. We find it in seven different occasions that we've, thought we've, re, uh, we've referred to already. Uh, and it's referring backwards to the Old Testament. So there must have been prophecies in the Old Testament. That's what we're, we're ref these things are referring to, Moses and the prophets. The prophecies of the Old Testament are important. Now, you might say to yourself, and we've had it in recent times, in actual fact, uh, a man who has been, not going to mention any names, but a man who has been making statements on our website uh, saying, this is all nonsense. Uh, kind of Stone Age men who didn't know any better, uh, and they were trying to uh, convince us there's a God in heaven. Well, the, the, the God in heaven definitely wants to convince us there's a God in heaven. Uh, and he is... It did it through uh, prophets and prophecies. Uh, and I suppose the way that you can uh, determine whether a prophecy is of any use or not is whether it is fulfilled or not. Um, and so if a prophecy is never fulfilled, then it's of no value. Now, we will be careful how we say that because there are prophecies in the scripture which have not yet been fulfilled, but there are many which have. And there are many in the scriptures with regard to uh, the, the Lord Jesus and his death at Calvary's cross. So it's important. That's why we're going to celebrate Easter in a week to come. That's why each week uh, in this building here, we have uh, a remembrance service. We remember the Lord Jesus and his death uh, until he come. And so um, th th it's important that we understand these things. And so right back in the Old Testament, I referred to earlier, right back at the beginning of the Old Testament in the book of Genesis in chapter 3, uh, we read something quite, it's quite interesting. Uh, and, to, and first, uh, reading it, it maybe doesn't mean what, to us what we think it, it should mean. We can't grasp what it really means. Uh, and he says, and he's, he's speaking uh, to, uh, the, the, to, to the devil, and he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so you might think to yourself, what does that mean? Well, in actual fact, it's referring forward. It's referring to the seed of the woman. Uh, and one of the statements about the, the Lord Jesus is this, that he is the seed of the woman. Interestingly, he doesn't speak to Adam with this information because it's not going to be the seed of the man which is important, it's going to be the seed of the woman. And remember that the Lord Jesus uh, came to earth through a virgin birth, it was the seed of the woman that was important. Uh, and so he, he is referring to a person who uh, would, uh, <coughs> he, whom he would bruise his heel and he would bruise his head. And so the person, this Satan would bruise the heel of the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus in his power would bruise the head of the serpent. And so very, in a, in a, almost in a vague sense to start with, this is opening up this prophecy right in the Old Testament scriptures uh, with regard to the Lord Jesus and his coming and his death at Calvary. But then we, we can move on quite a number of uh, chapters through the book of Genesis and there, uh, there are others as well. But we'll look at, we'll think about Genesis chapter 22. Uh, and there's a remarkable prophecy in chapter 22, a remarkable uh, event in chapter 22, uh, where Abraham and his son Isaac are going off to, uh, to sacrifice, make a sacrifice to uh, God. Uh, and they're walking up the, the mountain towards the sacrifice point. And uh, Isaac, having uh, seen sacrifices before, has a look at what's here and he's thinking to himself, there's something missing. Uh, and if there's somebody carrying the wood, and they've got a, they've got the fire on a pole, uh, and they're about to go up the hill, up to the Mount Moriah, to sacrifice the Lord to to the Lord Himself. And Isaac has a look, and he says, "Wait a minute, Dad." In a sense, you've got the fire, and you've got the wood, but where's the lamb? We can't have a sacrifice without a lamb. And Abram makes a statement which has been uh, and, and goes down through the ages in history. And here's what he says. 
God shall provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. God shall provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Now, we know the story, some of us, where they, they, uh, they get to the point of sacrifice. Uh, and Abraham binds up Isaac and puts him on the, on the altar and was about to plunge in the knife when the voice of heaven comes down and says, Hurt not the lad, lay not thy hand upon him. And he was released. But as we think forward to a day when uh, the Lord Jesus was going to be taken by his father and placed upon the cross in a, by way of sacrifice, but remember, he shall provide himself a lamb. And we hear in the New Testament, John the Baptist, when he um, sees the Lord Jesus coming, says, behold, the Lamb of God. Right back over hundreds of years to that statement that was made by Abraham. The fulfillment of something that happened, something that was prophesied in Abraham's day. Right up to the time when the Lord Jesus died. Uh, and so, on this occasion, of course, when the Lord Jesus was put to shame on Calvary, there was, there was no release. His father didn't untie him and allow him to come down. Remarkably, the Lord Jesus went all the way to Calvary and died for our sins. He became the lamb. And so God did provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Uh, and so we can remarkably, we can, and wonderfully, we can, we can look at a prophecy which has been fulfilled before our eyes just here in these scriptures that we've thought about already. You know, <clears throat> if it was only one prophecy, we might say to ourselves, well, I suppose that there is a chance that that could happen. It might not be uh, a big chance, but there is a chance that that could happen. Well, of course, the scripture doesn't finish there. Um, and the, we, we can go to uh, further on in Scripture from Genesis to the, the middle of our Bibles and go to the book of Isaiah, uh, and we can read there uh, a prophetic statement uh, about the Lord Jesus. If we were to go to Psalm 22, we would read there prophetic statements about the Lord Jesus, quite remarkable statements, quite remarkably uh, true uh, and accurate statements in the book of Psalms with regard to the Lord Jesus. When we come back to that later, let's think about the prophecy of Isaiah, which is a well-known uh, scripture. Strangely, strangely enough, the scroll uh, that holds the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 53, as we see it, that scroll has been lost, removed uh, from the Jewish thinking, the Jewish uh, hierarchy. They didn't like that one, so they took it away. Wonderfully, when there was a man came from um, another country, um, from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship, here's a, here's a copy of Isaiah 53. That scroll was available to him, and he took it, and he was reading from it, and that very man was converted that day to Christ at the preaching of Philip, the evangelist. Remarkable things, these. These are not chances. Uh, these are moments when God works in the hearts of individuals. So Isaiah 53 uh, and verse 3 says this. Let's just think about it. You, as, as I read these through, maybe you can think and, and just work out whether there's anything, any relationship to the cross of Christ 700 years before the crucifixion. Let, let's just think about it for a moment. Can you see anything in verse 3 which says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now, if you read about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find these very things that took place. He was despised. There were occasions when people wanted to throw him over the brow of the hill. There were occasions when they asked him to leave their town. And then there was occasions when they, they spat in his face. Verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. 
yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Pretty sure if you were to think about that for a wee while, you would realize that that just refers entirely to the Lord Jesus and his death at Calvary. Then verse 5. Verse 5 is quoted so often uh, as people talk about the, uh, the Lord Jesus and the cross of Calvary. And he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Remarkable, isn't it? But in this verse, in this, this chapter in the scriptures, there's a beautiful verse which refers entirely to the Lord Jesus, looking forward into the future about him, the one who was wounded for our transgressions, the one who was bruised. Remember the scripture said right at the very beginning, Thou shalt bruise his heel. He was bruised for our iniquities. Verse 6, we can see more in there. All we like sheep have gone astray. Well, that's so true, isn't it? You know, folks will know that I keep sheep as a for a living. And one of the things you'll notice, the first thing you notice about sheep is that they go astray. Now, some of our family have just become owners of some, somebody called them giraffe sheep. They're actually called alpacas. Uh, and they're with us as well. And we don't know if they go astray or not. We're about to find that out. But they're not sheep, so they might not go astray just to the same extent. All we like sheep have gone astray. That's referring to you and I. We are people who go against the will of God. I've turned everyone to his own way. But you notice this beautiful statement at the end of that verse. For those who have turned away from the Lord Jesus... For those who have gone astray, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Remarkable, isn't it? Absolutely wonderful. He was oppressed, says verse 7, and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And we see the statements. We've been thinking about the statements of the Lord Jesus uh, over these last few weeks in our online uh, message. Uh, and we're coming to the end of that today. And we find that the Lord Jesus uh, never takes to mention his own sufferings, but he like, thinks about the people who are there uh, in a sense. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now, that's quite remarkable as well that he should, that, that it should be a, a rich man who gave him his grave. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, and so, quite a remarkable set of events. And if we take all of these individual things as prophecies that are taking place in the book of Isaiah, the prophet, uh, and we add all them together, and we begin to realize that these things all took place. Um, and verse 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And so there's a number of different statements, a number of different things that have taken place in the book of Isaiah. We've thought of Genesis, we've, uh, and we've thought of the very beginning of Genesis as well. But what about uh, uh, some of the other things? Notice, uh, if you like, and uh, if you read the whole of Psalm 22, you'll find some wonderful things. You'll find in Psalm 34 that Jesus' bones were not broken uh, when he died on the cross. And that's referred to in John 19. It refers to himself. He says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, shall draw all men to me. Uh, and so it refers to himself in a prophecy uh, about the serpent on the pole uh, in the Old Testament scriptures, in the book of Exodus. So that we continue to build a picture of many, many prophecies which take place. They tell me there's 456 prophecies in the, in the Bible with regard to the Lord Jesus. Many of them have yet to, to be fulfilled, but the, remarkably, many of them have. And there's one person who put it 
like this. He's, he's a professor in a college and calculated the probability of one man fulfilling the major prophecies uh, of the scripture. Uh, and it said that after examining only eight different prophecies, they conservatively estimated that the chance of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies was one to the power 17. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but we have got a mathematician here who will tell us really how big a figure that is. It's a massive figure. Um, and that particular uh, thing just illustrates uh, that if uh, for, for uh, a small amount of prophecies, eight, if there are so many in the first place, there was, uh, what did we say, there was 456 prophecies. If all of them are fulfilled, how remarkable it is uh, that these things should be and how it could possibly um, not believe what the scripture says about this. And it says, but of course, there are many more than eight prophecies. In another calculation, the professor used 48 prophecies, even though he could have used uh, the original 456 and arrived at an extremely conservative estimate of 48 prophecies being fulfilled in one person is the incredible number of 10 to the 157. How, uh, how large is that? It's a massive, a massive uh, figure. Uh, and so the professor concludes at the end of his calculation, after he had showed it to many, many uh, very uh, established and esteemed uh, mathematicians to find out if he was right or not, uh, they agreed with him. Uh, and the professor concludes, any man who rejects Christ as the Son of God is rejecting a fact proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact in the world. Uh, and so what, we've, what we're bringing to you this afternoon uh, is not a fairy story, as some would have us believe, but is the absolute truth of God. The prophecies that are found in the Old Testament scriptures, that is why the Lord Jesus uh, said to the people, to individuals, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. That's why the Apostle Paul spoke to King Agrippa and said, look at Moses and the prophets. That's why uh, a man like uh, Nathaniel listened to the story of his friend about a man. We have found him of whom Moses and the prophets speak. Because it's true. It's an absolute true story. It's an absolute set of events which are looking forward from the beginning of time right up until the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. And when we think about the, when we think about the story of the Lord Jesus, we think about the story of the cross, we're amazed uh, uh, because of all that took place that day. We're amazed at a Savior who died for us at Calvary's cross. We're amazed that the God of heaven should, by his grace, should allow such a thing to happen. Remember what it says in the book of Isaiah, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. What a remarkable statement that is. What a remarkable prophecy. And you know, the prophecy of Isaiah, when we read it, we can see it as looking forward from uh, the day when it was penned to the day of the Lord Jesus, 700 years. But you know, if we, we could look at it from the point of view of the Jewish nation in a day to come, and here's another prophecy from the scriptures, in a sense, because there's a day coming when the Jews will look back and they'll say, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's still to be fulfilled, that part of the prophecy. The looking forward from Isaiah's day to the cross is fulfilled. The looking back by the Jews to the cross, to, to, to the cross and to the prophecy of Isaiah is yet to be fulfilled. How wonderful the day when that happens, when we'll hear of the nation
nation of Israel understanding who their saviour really was. I wonder today if you believe the Bible, if you believe what the scriptures talk about, what the Lord Jesus spoke about, the scriptures are important. The story of the cross is threaded through the whole of scripture. And it comes to be the center point of our world. It's not a, it's not a chance, you know, that the calendar of our world centers at the cross of Calvary. Quite remarkable. And so I wonder today if, you put, if you've ever put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I wonder if that's ever taken place. I wonder if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I wonder if you've repented of your sin and his presence to seek the blessing of the Lord, to seek the salvation of the Lord. And it's possible right here today. It's right in this very room, or in the, uh, for folks who are listening online, it's possible at the moment in time to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for his eternal salvation. He will never turn you away. You're never too bad. You're never too good to be saved or to need to be saved. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died at Calvary's cross. May you do so for his name's sake. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank thee for our time together this afternoon. We think of these marvellous things, the statements in thy word, which are so wonderful and so truthful and so much a pointer to the Lord Jesus from right from the very beginning of Scripture. And we thank thee for them. And we thank thee for the announcements made in the New Testament with regard to them, so that we might understand that prophecy is important, that the prophecies about the Lord Jesus are important. And they were prophesying and telling us about an event which has already taken place, but each one of us must come to the point where we, in a sense, spiritually stand before the cross and realize that the Lord Jesus was put to shame there for us. And so we seek thy help. Remember us all for good. There may be some who will trust in the Lord Jesus. For we ask these things now in the Savior's precious and holy name. Amen. Now your time's gone, so we won't sing a final hymn. Thank you for your time, for listening. And we look to God for his help upon these things today. Thank you. <laughs>